2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Tonight's meeting is a little different as always, not as always for the last couple, uh, because of the novel COVID-19 virus, thus we are holding this meeting remotely. Could we please start with a roll call? Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Edelgo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. Mary, you have a quorum. All right, great. By way of reminder, in order to provide public comment during the stay at home order due to COVID 19, residents have been invited to provide public comments prior to the meeting by submitting them in writing or via phone or video message. Comments are limited to three minutes per person, as always. Um, do we have any tonight, Don? We do, Mayor. We have about uh, six or seven, and I'll read those in tonight. All right, great. All right, then uh, let's go ahead. Do we have an, uh, let's go ahead. I'm not seeing a, uh, yeah, we'll do pledge. So I don't have a flag here this time. I'm in my home, unlike uh, the last two times. So we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance without a flag or standing. So you ready? All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of, America, States of America, America, to the republic for which it stands, a nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. All right. So can we go ahead and have a motion to approve the minutes of March 31st, 2020? So moved. All right. That was seconded by Joan. So it was moved by Council Member Christensen. It was seconded by Council Member Peck. All, uh, any debate or discussion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. Anybody have any agenda revision, submission of documents or motions? All right, that's cool. All right, let's move on then to city manager's report on the COVID-19 update and emergency items for consideration. Harold, the time is yours. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, today, you're actually gonna have three of us prepare the report for today. Um, I'm gonna start it off. And then Dan and I are gonna try to tag team the uh, his portion where I'm bringing screens up and then we'll move to Jim in terms of the financial work that we've been doing. A couple of things that I wanted to update you all on. Um, and so last week we had a question regarding golf. Actually, uh, we received some additional guidance from uh, Boulder County Health Department and the Colorado Department of Health in terms of what we need to do. They have indicated that um, golf courses can be open but with a list of about things this long that we have to do. And so Karen and Jeff and the Golf pros have been working on that. I've seen a draft of it um, and we'll be looking at it and then also watching the data in terms of making that decision. Um, you may or may not have seen, there was actually a news, um, was it? I'm getting feedback. Somebody's not muted. No, I'm not, sorry. Oh, all right, um, sorry, anyway. Um, there was actually a new special where they were actually looking at parks and golf courses, and um, I think the result of that was they were really following the um, social distancing requirements. So we're going to be working on that as we move forward and making sure that we're having everything in place. The key point is going to be that it is going to be reservations online that has to occur, um, driving range, pro shop, and those types of things will not be open show up 10 minutes before you go, and then you have to follow social distancing. So we'll be working on establishing all of those roles and then making a determination whether we're ready and we meet those requirements. I will personally reach out to Jeff just to chat with him and see, uh, make sure that we're consistent with his recommendations and the health department's recommendations on that. You know, there's been a lot of conversation regarding howling, um, and I know some people don't particularly care for it, but um, you know, our governor is, um, encouraging Coloradoans to join in the nightly ritual um, to help people feel connected and less isolated during this time. One of the things that we are seeing is fireworks, and um, I would like to request that the residents of our community not engage in, in the fireworks, um, just like we do in um, around the 4th of July. That just um, adds additional call volume for our uh, first responders and in what we're doing, and so I'm making that request. Um, so that we don't um, have the fireworks going off while people are participating in the call of the wild. Um, we will be sending some more information out on that. 
wanted to let you know that the CERT group that we actually was part of um, our flood recovery response and the training we did um, worked with our emergency management staff and um, our recreation staff, and they held a, uh, a donation for cloth masks. We actually received 375 cloth masks that we are uh, getting out to our city employees um, on a daily basis. Um, what we found out today in our CAM report that we still need masks for Mills on Wheels volunteers, um, that some of their senior clients, and um, we're seeing more need as we continue to get that out. And so we're looking to um, take off on what we did last Saturday and look at doing something uh, Wednesday of next week and then the Saturday and the following Wednesday and Saturday from 10 to 2 in terms of collecting more masks for individuals um, that need those. Um, we want to thank the community for their efforts and, and encouraging those with the, the skills and the materials to, if they could please um, consider donating more masks to those that need them within our community. Um, we're currently engaging in um, we're starting the conversations about recovery and planning for what that looks like. You all are probably going, we're in the middle of this. That's kind of how we approach this is while we're still dealing with that issue, we're starting to look to the future at the same time. Um, next meeting, we have a study session. Um, with everything we have going on, we really didn't have any agenda items, but I will want to reserve that time for a COVID update. And then there is a possibility we may have to convert that meeting to a regular session to relate um, because uh, we may have a COVID related IGA with the county and the health department um, that we were made aware of today. We're gonna have a meeting on Thursday to try to figure that out. So it's gonna be coming at the last minute, but it's really trying to provide more resources to the work that we're collectively doing in conjunction with the county. At that point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan for his um, detailed presentation on where we are today, and I'm going to try to drive images at the same time. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody is still healthy. Uh, we're going to try to tag team this because as I discovered early this evening, I am totally incompetent at WebEx, so we're going to see if we can move forward with this. Um, as a kind of a theme that we've been going through, you know, every time we've been doing these updates is data. And like I mentioned last week, we're getting a lot better data, and this week is no different. We're really starting to get into the specifics of what is Boulder County specific. So we're getting a whole lot more Boulder County centric data from the health departments, and they're getting, starting to get really good at displaying it. So all the stuff I'm going to show you today is publicly available. You can go on and check it every day. They update it. Most of it is updated every day. Um, we check this pretty religiously every day. So it's a good way to just kind of track how things are going. And I'm going to try to explain to you the things that we look for uh, that are kind of important to us. So the site that you're looking at now is linked from Boulder County site. This is Boulder County Public Health and the data that they gather and the way that they display it. So the, the top numbers there are, they're pretty obvious, right? It's the, the positive test right at the top. And they're starting to add in the total hospitalizations and like was asked last time, they're recovered. So they're really starting to get better at telling us who has recovered from hospitalizations, who's recovered from being positive. Um, the disease investigation is currently in progress. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. And then um, unfortunately at the bottom is um, the number deceased. That number's up to 15 now. Um, Harold, if you'll scroll down just a little bit and uh, go down to the three-day average growth. So this three-day average growth, average growth graph is one of the most important ones that we're really looking for because this is a good visual representation of flattening the curve. So what we're really looking for here is that those numbers all the way to the right, really trying to remain steady or even start to point downward like they did between yesterday and today. So that's really just an average growth rate of cases. And the longer that those can spread out, that really is telling us that this social distancing is working. So that's a really important graph that we look at. Um, the next one down is the age range. And we're still hovering in that average is about 50 for the average person that gets COVID. And if you scroll down even further, 
you get into some more detail of really breaking down more demographics. So the positive test versus how they get hospitalized, um, whether they're in ICU or not. And then all the way on the right, the, the dark red, I'm going to guess that is, is um, deceased. So we still are in the, the most serious cases are in the 60 and over. And if you go down even further, we start to get into town and city of residence. And this is where it gets even a little more interesting. So you'll see at the top, the number, the top two numbers, of course, are Boulder and Longmont, which is what you would expect for the top two population centers. But if you scroll down a little bit more, the, the good news for Longmont is it breaks it down then into a percentage, well, not percentage, but a the number per 100,000. So you see on the far right, Boulder's the top, and then Lafayette and Louisville are ahead of Longmont. And what that tells you is the citizens of Longmont are paying attention to what we're asking them to do and what the governor's asking them to do. So that's another good number for us to keep tracking. Um, that's something else that we'd like to ask you all to do is please help us with that message. Um, we have some a week of good news here, but that certainly does not mean that we are out of the woods yet. We need to continue what we're doing, and the more that you all can do to help us with that, the better. And the last number on this at the very bottom is just the long-term care facilities, which from the very beginning, these are really, we've watched these very closely because certainly this is where some of our older adults are located all in the same area. And we really want to place a lot of resources here. Public health spends a lot of time here. Um, we know the hospitals are involved in this and we try to facilitate conversations as we can. And we try to really understand what's going on with the long-term care facilities to make sure we don't have significant outbreaks in those settings. Um, Harold, if you flip over to the, the county one real fast, I'm sorry, the state one. Yeah, the one thing I wanted to say when you see currently hospitalized, I will tell you that um, if you saw some of the news last night, they were actually talking about the data that Boulder County is displaying today versus others, and they are getting um, more granular. Uh, but the other thing that it, they also talked about is I do want to let you all know and the community know they are trying to work with the hospital groups in terms of getting even more data available to us. So on the state site, um, this is kind of um, obviously a state level look at what's going on, the, the cases, the hospitalizations, and a couple numbers here that, that are important to us. Certainly the, the Boulder number is important, but if you scroll down and you look at the Weld County number, um, that number keeps going up relatively significantly. That's at 858 now. Um, yesterday was about, I think it was 802 yesterday. And the Boulder County number yesterday was 284. So the growth rates are pretty significantly different. So we continue to watch that because the Weld County numbers certainly impact Longs Peak Hospital on our Eastern border. That's um, an impact on our medical system here. The, uh, the, uh, the JBS plant certainly is part of that in Weld County that we're um, kind of monitoring the impacts of on, on our healthcare system here. And then Harold, can you scroll down a little bit here? Try to get to that, that hospitalization graph. So a little bit of a note on um, that one right there. So this is another good visualization of that flattening of the curve. So this is statewide, but the Boulder County line looks almost identical to this. So you can see there over towards the right, we really are starting to flatten out the, the number of hospitalized cases are dropping day over day. And there's a difference in, this is the more important number to us, these hospitalized cases, as opposed to the overall cases. Because another one of the good items of, of note here is the, in, the increased amount of testing that we can do. So there's a lot of increased testing capacity locally and through the state. Both of our hospitals can test um, not only first responders and healthcare workers, but they're looking at ways they can start expanding that out. They're definitely not there yet. But as we increased our testing capacity, the number of cases are going to go up. And that's as weird as it is to say that's almost a good thing because we know the community spreads out there. We know the cases are out there. But as we test, if that number goes up and the hospitalization rate here remains flat, 
that means that we're getting better at testing and isolating, which is one of the most important things we can do to eventually get out of this um, stay-at-home order. If we don't have the ability to test and isolate, then we're really going to have to think about being able to lift this order. So it's kind of strange to think about, but as the number of cases go up, that's not necessarily a bad thing when you compare it to the number of hospitalizations. Um, A couple other things I just wanted to point out. I know there was a question last week about ventilators. Um, The the, ventil- the hospital system locally still remains in, in good shape. Um, they have the whole week. We talk to them every day. Their capacity is good. Um, the county capacity remains good. We have not significantly pushed the capacity. Um, we, we had a meeting with the agency administrators of the, the county today, and Jeff Zayak, the director of public health, was on. And um, he and the other Metro public health directors are feeling pretty good about where we are in the hospital surge right now. Um, They feel as though we've held pretty well and they're feeling good about where we are in the next week or two. So that's pretty good news. Um, The other question about uh, ventilators was, is Colorado going to get any? Um, Colorado did get a hundred ventilators from the national stockpile, but none went to Boulder County, which, is almost weirdly enough sort of a good thing too. That means we weren't significantly in need of them right now, but we did not get any in this county. Um, A couple other things I just wanted to point out, like Harold mentioned the the mask drive. Uh, That was, it was a wonderful outpouring from the community. We've already handed out 200 of those to city staff and we're gonna be handing out the rest in the next day or two. We're certainly gonna need a lot more of those. As we move into this next phase, we're really talking about what is that transition into really ep- emphasizing the economic recovery look like? What does the staff needs for that look like? How do we balance that with, um, I guess, what you would call normal duties at this point? And then down the road, really starting to look at um, post um, whatever the governor decides to do with lifting orders, how does that affect city facilities, city staff, um, what that could look like in the future, and everything we would need to do to start accommodating that. I think that's my my update. Um, certainly, we can answer any questions that you have. But I think the overall message right now is uh, things are looking looking okay. I mean, that curve is flattening out. Um, we're holding okay with our PPE, and the hospitals are uh, managing to hold on to the surge. So I think those are all positive messages I have for you today. Yeah, I think the term we're using is we're cautiously optimistic. You may have heard others say that recently. Um, I think Polly has a question. Thank you for the update. Um, and I, I do feel like we're getting <clears throat> the, the um, physical distancing is helping. It's helping all over the country where it's being done. We can see in places where it's not being done, like Weld County, that it's a problem. So I, I appreciate that because people need to feel like there's um, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I'm wondering, Dan, if we are getting, uh, I, I really appreciate you saying that testing and isolating is really important. It's very difficult to get any testing. Um, and that's a problem all over the country and to also get it processed. I know a lot of people are working on that. Are we getting any more ability to test? We are, but we're limited right now to um, the the tiers that public health is still set up. They're still working on um, those that are hospitalized first, but we've moved past that now. So now um, our first responders are getting tests back in a day or two, where before it was taking seven to 10 days. So we were having, you know, police and firefighters home for 10 days, just waiting on a test result. We're past that now. They're moving down to where we have the capacity to get those back in a day or two. And that's with, we can get that done through Kaiser and both health systems now. Um, they're moving on to pretty much any other healthcare worker. And you know the, the next stages after that are um, anybody with kind of underlying health conditions, but they're not quite at that level of, of the community yet. But it's a pretty positive step that they're working down that list. And the capacity is certainly dramatically increased from where we were last week. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, the other thing is, I, I know that people all over town are sewing masks like crazy little demons. Um, if a lot of those efforts, as we talked about last week, are being coordinated with the city and hidden treasures, mm -hmm. um, is that still the case? Or should people be able to bring, can people bring things to the city and who, who, do, who should who should we be contacting if we want to do that? I'm sick right now, so I can't be sewing because that, that would not be a good idea, but. Sure. sure. <laughs> so we, we are working, still working with hidden treasures and we do want to limit the, the drop off to the, the days that, that Harold mentioned because we can staff those days and we can immediately wash the masks and we can package them. We can do a lot of different things with the staff okay. we have there. And we prevent people from kind of driving around to city facilities that aren't really open anyway. So yeah. if we can, we try to target those days where we have staff available to, to receive the masks. And um, the PIT group is doing a great job of giving all that stuff out. You know, it's out through all of our social media. It's out on the website. You know, they do a great job of getting those things out. And our goal is to do those often enough. So there's, you know, an option of one or two times a week that people can come and drop those off. Yeah, and I also want to thank you for uh, directing people to the county websites, and I think they're doing a the county's doing a great job of uh, giving people legitimate sites that they can go to and get the real facts, and uh, that does a lot to helping people understand that this is this is limited. We need to just keep doing this for a while, and uh, we'll get out of this eventually uh, sooner, I think, than later. So, thank you for all you're doing. I think I wanted to add something that Dan talked about is I think a lot of our conversations this week to the point of testing are really focusing on testing and the epidemiological tracing. Um, that tends to be a lot of our conversations and, and I think that's pro that's going to be a product of the IGAs and what we do and how do we get volunteer, I mean, how do we as the city work with the county to make sure they have, um, if they need it, resources to do some of that tracing. and so. Just to let council know, we're spending a fair amount of time on that now. Council Member Peck. Thank you. Uh, Dan, would you mind, um, I just had some people text me that they just logged on. Would you mind telling, once again, the times and days that they can drop off the mask? Thank you. Harold, do you remember those? I've got them right here. So Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, 10 to 2 at the rec center. And then the following Saturday, um, 10 to 2 at the rec center. And then we're going to go the week after Wednesday, 10 to 2, and then Saturday, 10 to 2. And again, we'll get those things out far and wide. Um, you know, our, our comm staff is great at getting all that stuff out. So, All right, Harold, anything else? Um, yes, um, we need to go to Jim now. Um, I think one of the things that... We talked to you all about at the last uh, or times running together, but one of the last meetings was really about the financial situation. I'm going to turn that over to Jim to go over. Um, one of the things that I want to say to council before he starts is um, this is a, a significant financial issue for uh, local governments. Um, you may or may not have heard, but I believe last week um, the city of Broomfield announced um, furloughs for a couple of months for their um, staff members and that was composed of full and part-time staff um, and then unfortunately today um, the city of boulder also announced furloughs and and so as municipalities we're all struggling with this the one thing i do want to point out is that we're all different and we have a different economic basis and different um, you know, structures financially that we put together, but um, we are all talking on a regular basis and working collectively to, to see if we're understanding the same way, the situation in the same way. But this is going to be a, um, a, a significant financial issue for us now. And then it's also going to be one as we enter the uh, 2021 budget work that we're going to have to do. Um, the items that Jim's going to present is really the situation now in this fiscal year. As we have more data, we will then be evaluating 
um, what we present to you all. We were scheduled to present May 5th for budget conversations and looking to the future. Um, we're going to try to hold to that date, but really at this point, we're trying to get as much information as we can to look to the future, but this is going to be a challenge for us. Jim? Okay, uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. So I think it was three weeks ago that I uh, first gave you our uh, first round of projections for the impacts from the COVID-19 event. So these are uh, constantly being reviewed and updated as we get new information. Well, what we have currently is based on the same assumptions, though, that we would go through two full months of severe impacts on our sales and use tax, and then following that with a recession for the rest of the year, which would uh, be estimated 5% drop below 2019 levels of sales and use tax. So still sticking to, to that for now uh, through this point in time. Uh, we have updated the projections, though, by including in them uh, some other general fund revenue sources that also will be impacted. Things like our recreation revenues. Actually, I think I might have had that in the first one, but our investment revenues, development revenues, fines and forfeits, utility disconnects, union, union reservoir fees, museum fees, and licenses and fees as well. So we've estimated impacts for all those over that same two month uh, period of time. And that was the total $1.77 million impact to the general fund. So adding that with uh, $13.2 million of a sales tax impact across all five funds, and then a $300,000 shortfall in the Gulf Fund if it were to re remain closed for two months, that overall impacts are now at $15.3 million, as you see on the slide. On the screen, spread across these five funds, obviously the largest impact is in the general fund between the fact that they're getting about half of that sales tax, as well as that 1.77 million of other revenues. Next slide. So to this point, what we've done is we began to already instill some controls on expenses. You know, we stopped doing any out of town training expenses, obviously. We instituted a selective hiring freeze. So what that means is that if in a position uh, it needs to be filled, it's gonna need Harold's permission before it can be done. Otherwise, most uh, positions will remain open until uh, we decide otherwise. We've also asked staff to begin to identify other savings uh, possibilities from deferring expenses in the 2020 budget, as well as in the 2020 CIP projects. Uh, the, we've, what I've done is, is evaluate all of our emergency reserve balances and their availability and how we might be able to use those to offset some revenue shortfalls. Uh, under your own financial policies, we have uh, emergency reserve requirements for uh, each of these funds shown on this slide. And these are the dollar amount of those balances at the end of, of 2019. Now the general fund, as we've talked about in different times in the past, has a uh, um, kind of a three prong type of reserve policy. The first part of it is a, a Tabor reserve policy, which is about 5% or so of the general fund. And that's figured based on the um, um, state law on Tabor emergency reserve requirements. Then we have an 8% reserve under your own policies as well. That is for emergencies as well. And then uh, on top of that, we are, we've been trying to build a stability reserve and only just started to do that last year. Uh, but at this point in time, it, it uh, going into this budget for 2020, that was equating to about $1.7 million. So um, all of these amounts, again, are available for each of those these funds. We're not committing all of them just yet towards the shortfalls. Uh, I think we need to be careful about how 
quickly we use up our emergency reserves, especially given the fact that we're not sure how long this will last. I'll talk about each of these funds and how we're, uh, some of these funds, but each of the sales tax funds and how we're using them uh, in a few minutes here. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna try to shorten this up. I don't know if you've read the information that I got to you today. I'm sorry, I got to see you so late, but in fact, uh, I'm not gonna bore you with this, but in fact, we've been having to put money away into a reserve fund called it a trust fund, but technically hasn't been a trust. And we've been doing it for uh, post-employment benefits, basically retiree uh, healthcare insurance, the small subsidy that we pay for our employees for they retire, when they retire before age 65. Uh, 10 years ago, we were directed to begin to put that money aside away for liability. And in fact, we have now determined with the assistance of new auditors and a new actuary that, that was, we're actually addressing those expenses on a pay-as-we-go basis. And that, that $3.5 million we have put away there is actually not needing to be put away, which uh, I won't say too much about the fact, but I've been questioning it for 10 years. But anyway, so it's a great time for us to find this out because that is basically providing us three and a half million dollars of equity that we would not have had in any other year available to us. It's going to go back to about 25 different funds that have been putting the money towards this anywhere where we have payroll. We've been putting money towards this um, to the health benefit fund and the health benefit fund is what actually has been paying this OPEB of dollars or OPEB expense each year. Uh, so I will point out how much of an impact that is on some of these funds as we go through it. Next slide, please. So in the general fund, um, we, we have an $8.7 million shortfall. Um, you know, I will point out, I did the first time we talked about this, I will again, if this, if this lasts longer than a two month um, impact on, on severe drop in sales tax, then these, these estimates go up higher. And I will point out as I go through each fund, how much that will increase for those funds. So, but given the, the shortfall that we projected 8.7 million in the general fund, Things that we're doing to offset that, we already talked to you about the stabilization reserves, that's 1.7 million. The o OPEB equity I just talked about is 2.1. Hey, Jim. I yes, think, uh, hey, Brian, Mayor, we're seeing questions. Hold on, I don't see, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see that because I don't see, all I see is the general fund. Uh, I don't see people, I just see the uh, presentation on my screen. I see Councilman so Martin. Can we, yeah, but can we wait till the end of the, the presentation before we go to questions? Councilmember Martin? She's nodding her head, yes. Okay, let's just, let's just keep going then. And then, Councilmember Martin, you're in the queue. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we've had is we, this year in the 2020 budget process, we had uh, a lot of, of one time money available to us as well as some operating money that we um, didn't utilize for operating expenses, I should say ongoing revenue, that we did not utilize for ongoing expenses. The reason we did that is because we had concerns about the 2021 budget process and our ability to <clears throat> keep up with increasing cost, given that that was gonna be a year where there would be no growth in property tax. So what we did is uh, we had about $885,000 of property tax uh, revenue that was uh, um, budgeted and uh, not used for ongoing expenses, but instead for one-time type expenses. Uh, we also had some use tax money that for a few years now, each year we, we are also doing <clears throat> something similar with use tax from building permits, not using them for ongoing expenses. So we have about 1.3 million from those two sources that we put toward the main uh, first and main transit station. And then we had another $1.2 million left over from or projected to be left over from 19 operations, either savings or excess revenues. So we put $2.5 million towards the first and main transit station. 
It's a $5 million project in the CIP that this, the uh, city is, uh, needs to uh, come to the table with to, to be able to match the input from RTD that we still need to get from them of about 17 million, I believe. We have one and a quarter of a million already put aside, and this was gonna take us up to 3.75 million of that needed $5 million. But what we are doing here in this action would be we're essentially unfunding that two and a half million and using it to offset revenue shortfalls. Uh, we had some dollars set aside in the general fund balance of $565,000 uh, for in case a potential grant didn't come through. We're putting that instead towards this as well. And then finally, we did have $300,000 that we had set for a contingency uh in a general fund for the city managers control and uh, we've already utilized part of that but uh the balance that's in pl place of almost two hundred forty five thousand dollars is available so this is 7.18 million here to offset the shortfall it gives us 1.5 that we still have to um have to generate through budgetary savings i did give you an attachment to this i'm not going to take you through the attachment tonight but it gives you an awful lot of detail of the type of, of budgetary adjustments that we're making in multiple funds, whether they be up to the amount of the shortfalls or beyond the shortfalls uh, that we are planning on. So included in that is how we would address this one and a half million dollars, but it would include mostly vacancy savings from freezing positions, as well as some other uh, one-time expenses that we can defer and uh, or consider deferring and as well as uh, some uh, budgetary savings from managing our budgets tighter next slide please i right, would just want to point back out on the general fund uh so every month longer that the conditions were that i described were to persist that would be another 2.4 or 5 million impact on the general fund and i think that's at this point i'll just call that a somewhat conservative estimate until we know more about the total sales tax impact we're about a month through this now so when i say that's two months of impact we've only got another month coming to us before we start to exceed that the public safety fund here we got uh their eight percent emergency reserve Public safety fund really doesn't have a lot of flexibility to deal with changes in their revenues. So we have to devote their full emergency reserves to this, this shortfall because most of their budget is salary and benefits. Uh, the OPEB equity here is 198,000. We're unfunding the expansion of the communications uh, center. And uh, we also have some ex extra reserve fund balance beyond the 8% reserve that we're using to offset the rest of that shortfall there. And every extra month of uh, impact here is another $700,000 on this fund. So in the public improvement fund, next slide. We have a shortfall of 580,000. We're just up uh, offsetting that with CIP project savings or deferrals. All that's outlined on the uh, attachment that I gave you, uh, which projects are impacted. And each another month here is $178,000 shortfall for this fund. Next slide. Streets fund is a $2.8 million shortfall. The OPEB equity is 146,000 here. We are going to make, do some increase, a decrease in street operations of that will have generate two hundred ninety five thousand dollars of impact and then we have cip project savings and deferrals for the rest of these savings here to to uh, generate the 2.8 million dollars needed for this shortfall and each another month here is worth close to a nine hundred thousand dollar impact on this fund next slide the open space fund, $750,000 shortfall, small amount of OPEB equity here. And the rest of it is made up by CIP project savings or deferrals. Again, all those are on the attachment that we provided. 
And the impact in this fund is $240,000 for each additional month. And then the golf fund, basically the golf fund is, is $300,000 impact. If we uh, do not reopen, the city manager talked about that potential happening. So if that happens, it's not a $300 impact. We do have a strong fund balance relatively here of 1.2 million. And they did identify as well. Well, they do have the OPEB equity and they did identify some CIP savings on the, uh, um, on the other uh, attachment as well. Next slide, please. So again, if, if it, it does go on longer than, than we've uh, uh, identified of two months, then uh, we will need to consider other solutions to try to generate further savings. Uh, most of the, a lot of the funds that are on that attachment have already begun to identify additional savings. There are other funds on there that I haven't even touched on that also are beginning to identify savings. Uh, our enterprise funds are, at this point, they're, they're looking at deferring uh, CIP projects and such. It's hard to tell, but we're beginning to see a uh, decrease in this time at, in the amount of our utility bill payments. It's going to take some time before those, those accounts begin to, to reach um, delinquent status. But just by tracking the payments, which I try to do from day to day and comparing them to previous uh, last year and previous months, it does appear like we're probably beginning to fall behind in our payments. So our enterprise funds are gonna be having some impact as well. So, um, so really we've identified these, these solutions for dealing with other sh shortfalls um, and for a longer period of time of, of sales tax decreases. First of all is continuing hiring freezes and budgetary controls. That's not not like we're expecting uh, a lot of turnover at this point in time. But if any positions do turn over, they'll all be subjected to the same hiring and freeze that we've talked about to this point. For the CIP project deferrals that I've identified that are on that attachment, and then uh, I mentioned that the general fund does still have an eight percent emergency reserve. It's six point nine million dollars, uh, so it, it is there. Like as I mentioned, we need to be careful about how we use that up. Table reserve is really hard to, to uh, actually utilize because by law, you got to replace it by the, um, by the end of the year anyhow. So it, we're really looking at trying to deal with this full year. So I don't see the table reserve as being an available solution. Oil and gas revenue, we are receiving uh, some significant oil and gas revenue. So we have identified that potentially we might be able to utilize that revenue that is in excess of the budgeted expenses that we have for 2020. And then uh, finally, we have uh, service reductions and or fur furloughs uh, reductions in force would, would be a uh, final uh, solution. Um, we, you know, the city manager mentioned uh, the 2021 budget process you know, by by midsummer or so, we have to know what we're going to do in that budget and what we're going to propose to the council on September 1st. I'm hoping we learn a lot about our revenues in the next few months so I have a much better handle on what we're going to have to deal with. But uh, quite frankly, from a, um, certainly from a general fund perspective and any sales tax uh, related fund, we're concerned about the 2021 budget and the impacts and how long a uh, recession goes on and how, how much of an impact it has. We are taking what I would call one-time adjustments and, and solutions to make up for this shortfall here in 20. And that's an acceptable way of dealing with this type of, of a situation. But when we get to doing that 2021 budget, it needs to be balanced between ongoing revenues and ongoing expenses. And if our projections for ongoing revenues are decreasing significantly from what we put in the 2020 budget, then there'll need to be in like, like significant reductions on the expenditure side as well, which would, would impact our service levels. 
think that's all I have. I can start answering any questions you might have. Could we get could we get the screen back so we can see everybody? Stop sharing the screen. Yeah. There we go. All right. Who had Marsha? Uh, Councilmember Martin, you're up. Okay. Um, the one just clarifying questions. It got a little better through uh, Jim's presentation, but which exactly two months of shortfall are you counting? Is this March, April, or April, May? Uh, good, good question, Councilmember Martin. I actually, I would say it's not uh, calendar months. I would look at it from the, the point in time when the businesses uh, were beginning to close, which I would think, like, as I mentioned, somewhere through there, I think we're about a month through that point at this time. So I would say it's uh, the past four weeks and the, and the next four or so weeks are the two months I'm talking about. We actually, you know, I, I, I think I, what I did is, is try to just assume we would get our full amount for the first two months. And then if the rest of those final eight months were all going to be um, that recession impact. So in a way that hopefully that, that we don't have as much of a significant impact in the, in the early part of March, which I'll know more probably in another week or so when the tax due date comes up, then, then we might be a little bit ahead of our, our projections because, um, well, there'll be, offsetting our, our uh, recession uh, assumptions, I guess. But those were the two months I used. Okay, thank you. And then the other question I have, um, is you mentioned the first in main station and uh, two and a half million dollars that's set aside uh, for uh, um, getting the match uh, for the funding from RTD. How much, again, was the, was the total that's needed to qualify for that match? So I think the city share was projected at $5 million total. Okay. CIP. Yeah. So, so my question is, I mean, we do have a, a stimulating a recovery to look at and $17 million coming in from outside would, do, would be quite a significant stimulus. Um, is there any, um, is is there any short term scenario that does not um, require, or could we look at a short term scenario that does not require uh, diverting that two and a half million dollars? At least not yet. We're asking you to look at it than asking for an answer right now, but. I think we can look at it, but to Jim's point, we would have to then look into operational issues or we would have to look into the next fund balance. Um, and we don't know what's coming at us in the future. Mm -hmm. um, what I've talked about in terms of this is I think we'll then have to look from a timing perspective in terms of, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of prioritization happening and we'll have to look at um, essentially the um, street fund, which does cover some transit, and to see if there's options there in terms of how you could look at a long-term financing structure. Um, the um, the other piece is the 17 million is direct funding from RTD, mm -hmm. so we may be able to work on the timing on that in terms of how that looks, and then how we can build dollars in maybe on the back side of it. Um, yeah, but those are all things we're going to have to look at with that project. Right. I just hate to say goodbye to that 17 million. No, the, I, well, the 17 million's held. I mean, and so that's mm -hmm. where I was saying on that, we may have to work with RTD in terms of um, when we bring our match in to maybe give us some time to, to look at that. That's ah. a different conversation. Yeah, that's encouraging, though. Thank you. Jim. Dr. Waters, actually, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, did you raise your hand earlier or no? Okay, Dr. Waters, you're up. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Just just before we leave that, the last point here on, on Main Street Station, we were still at least a year away, weren't we, from accumulating the $5 million we were going to need to satisfy the match requirement? At least. So it would, it would have been no sooner than 21 and maybe not till 22, as I recall. Yeah, okay. 
Yep, I think that's and correct. Um, specifically for Jim, just in terms of the numbers, and then I have a more kind of general uh, political question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Jim, you provided a fair amount of, of data of uh, detail that you you didn't you made general reference to in your presentation, uh, and I just uh, you know if I do an eyeball, I didn't I didn't take out a calculator. It's somewhere around eighteen and a half, I think, million dollars of, of potential reductions in expenditures. Did you provide provide that for us just in, in just to kind of show what's possible if we exceed that fifteen point three million? Yeah. Uh yeah, Councilmember Waters, in in a way, yes, and in, in another way, our, our staff is trying to plan for worst case scenarios, and so they didn't. They should just stop there, and they're identical because a lot of these are CIP projects. We don't want to start them if, in fact, we're going to have to pull a plug on them. Yeah, so, that's what I assume. I just wanted to confirm because yeah. we were there's way more data, way more detail, which I appreciate. And the and the numbers run north of where what we were looking at, but just understand this that I was understanding it properly. More, the more general question, you know, as we hear about uh, whatever the next relief package is, there's some we hear references to recovery for state budgets and municipal budgets. Do we have any? We've been in contact at all with our congressional delegation. We have any idea whether that's even possible in a, in another uh, congressional package? Um, that's what we're trying to figure out right now. Um, I talked about Peter and Charlie in terms of what they're putting out in these congressional packages and what we're looking at in terms of shovel-ready projects. I know that they were talking about infrastructure. It looked like there was something that was coming forward on water, but then it morphed into something else. So we have um, folks directly in communication with um, our congressional delegation and trying to understand what that's going to look like and be ready for it just like some of the money that came in in the original cares program yeah you know really the only money that's been operationalized is the sbdc component they've now pushed those other components into agencies and we're trying to look at that and um, those are things we're going to be feeding into you all um, typically just so you know it's going to be um, what we're hearing and what we thought we were going to hear on the water side was going to be shovel ready projects so they're going to be projects that are ready to go and so then we have to look at, so what do we have in play where we were going to put dollars toward and can we put that in one of those buckets and then take those dollars and start, um, you know, moving through this. So that, I'm going to, I'm going to interpret that as being uh, at least one small reason to be hopeful. Uh, not number one, that we're positioned well. Number two, um, that there would be money, not just in the, that first or the last, the, I guess it was the third package, but in the next uh to help offset some of the shortfalls that municipalities are facing and then we kind of bring that up against back into this mix that jim's presented tonight into that i think peter and and we had several staff members on a town hall today specifically asking these questions of our senators all right thanks councilmember christensen this takes me a while to get unmuted Me too. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jim, thanks. I think that was a very, uh, very good and thorough, if not cheerful, presentation. Um, <laughs> but we want to know the truth. We don't want to have uh, happy talk. We want to know the truth. So, um, I have two questions that have to do with employees. Uh, first of all, as part of this uh, stimulus package um, to keep people employed, People can have a grant, get a grant, companies can get a grant to keep people employed. Um, is that something that uh, municipalities can avail themselves of? That maybe that's a question for Harold. Harold um, I, I have not seen that we would be eligible for those. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Ah, that's too bad um, because, you know, having to lay people off and then uh, try to find them again after months have passed is not possible. Um, can, can, can I, I want to But uh, one more thing, um, the OPEB fund, um, which Jim alluded to, I'm sorry, my phone is going off. Um, the OPEB fund 
that has to do with retirement. I don't want anything to affect retirement. Jim said that this was sort of a, uh, it wasn't actually a trust anymore. I, don't know. I just want to be reassured that we aren't taking money out of uh, our employees' retirement fund or their health care funds. Uh, Council Member Christensen, in fact, I think it's, it, we're not doing anything that will impact our employees or retirees. It's <clears throat> been dollars that that we've been setting aside under a um, uh, basically an accounting directive, more or less. And we, it, it's under the assumption certain plans you will need to pay, not our plans, but certain entities will have plans where they'll have to draw from these type of funds in the future for to pay those expenses. We okay. pay them each year in the premiums we pay. We fund them every year through our health benefit fund contributions, and we pay those expenses as we go. And so we've never had to take money from that fund. As long as we continue to pay as we go, we would never have to take money from that fund. And so finally we have auditors come in here and say, you know, that's even a trust, which I knew because I never wanted to set it up as a trust because I kind of had a feeling we end up like this. And they said, you don't need to do this either because you're. So we were like, OK, we thought all along. And so now we're be able to take it out of there. Doesn't okay. affect Thanks, Jim. Any other questions for Mr. Golden? Harold, you were going to say something earlier. Do you still, still want to say something? Yeah, I want to say something. Um, you know, if you if you go to Jim's slide, um, and I've been having conversations with with our staff. Um, you know, we're an organization. Um, Seventy percent of, uh, of of our our budget goes to people because we are an organization based on people. And what we've said is that we want to move through. The analogy I've used is a seven layer cake in terms of how we're moving through this. And there's a reason when you saw the service reduction at the, the bottom of the list is, and we really want it to be there and, and, and be, uh, you know, last resort as, as we're trying to deal with items this year. Um, and so we're not saying at this point that people are gonna be thorough, but we did wanna be honest and say, if this goes on, you know, we're gonna have to really start digging into some of these options. Um, the last thing I wanted to say and touch on something that Jim said is when we talked about the 2021 budget um, and really it's okay to, to correct a budget mid-year with these types of one one time sources. But when you look into the next budget year, it's a different conversation. And I would remind you when we talked about the budget reset that Jim and I were talking about for a few budget cycles, that was in large part because we were um, we balanced the 08 recession off of one time funds and not making those ongoing adjustments. So then it took us a number of years to, to move through it. That's exactly what we're talking about and where we're going to have to be really focused as we start coming into these future budgets and really making sure one time funds or are, are ongoing funds are there for ongoing expenses and 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 really resist the temptation at times to use one-time funds for that because that just creates a different issue for you over time. All right, if there's no other questions, let's move on. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Dan. Um, can we go ahead and read the first call public invited to be heard, Don? You bet, Mayor. Uh, the first one is from Ruth uh, Risbeck. 1325 Wild Rose Court, and she says, a Longmont resident sent a writ written request to the city to open the public golf courses. I do not support her request. All one needs to see is the picture in the Times Call Thursday edition of two men at U on Wednesday, course closed, golfing. No face protection and no social distancing. Opening the courses will only multiply that carelessness and poor judgment. Please do not even broach the issue of opening the golf courses now. Keep us as safe as possible. The next one is from Vicki Marchino, 1124 Purdue Drive. And Vicki says, as a resident of Longmont and the president of the Sweet Spots Golf League, I respectfully request that the city of Longmont open the golf courses for play during this crisis. The courses can be opened with social distancing restrictions. 
I, for one, am not a runner, hiker, or kayaker. I'm a golfer. I golf for exercise, stress relief, and because it's just damn fun. The Sweet Spots Golf League is a ladies' league that has been playing at Twin Peaks Golf Course for 32 years. Our league is supposed to start in May. Lamont Golf requires leagues to pay in advance for our league play. Normally at this time, I am collecting league, league fees from past members and recruiting new members to our league. With the golf courses closed and no opening date in sight, I'm having a difficult time collecting league fees. If I don't have enough players prepaid before our league actually starts, I will have to cancel our league for the first time in 32 years. We don't want to cancel our league. Please open the Longmont courses with social distancing restrictions so we can bring reviews into Longmont Golf and begin to plan for our league play this summer. Respectfully, Vicki. The next one is from Chris Vaswig at 1609 19th Avenue. This comment is regarding the lack of social distancing and overcrowding at some of our parks. I have been a Longmont resident for over 20 years now and truly love it here. And one of the things I am most proud of is how much work and resources we have placed in our parks and open space systems. Currently, there are many people enjoying the fruits of those labors. The issue currently is that there are too many people traveling to specific areas that result in overcrowding at certain parks and open space areas while leaving many of them empty. I do firmly believe that these are valuable resources and that we should be encouraging responsible use of our public areas during these times. Though it would seem that some restrictions may have to be in place in order to keep from having to resort to shutting down those resources to everyone. Living near McIntosh Lake, I can tell you firsthand that there are constantly crowds and too many people traveling to the lake for it to remain a safe place to enjoy the outdoors. My suggestion is to close the parking lot and prohibit street parking for non-neighborhood residents at some or all of our city parks and open spaces for the next few weeks to encourage residents to spread out to the parks and open spaces that are closer to home. This will go a long way to preserving the safety of all residents of Longmont and helping to stop the spread of COVID-19 while still keeping our wonderful parks and open space areas open. Thank you. The next one is from Jackie Coldaway of 837 Widgeon Drive. Jackie says, people who love golf, adults especially, and even the high school teams, it would be so help healthy and the city would get revenue. All right, let me get to the next one. This one is from Colleen, Ooh, she has a hard last name, Mazurkiewicz. She is from 202 Grant, C Grant Street, she says, please open the public golf courses in Longmont, enforce social distancing practices, require pool carts or walking only, no golf carts, no rental clubs, and limit the number of people in the clubhouse. Thank you. The next one is from Ian Peck at 2424 9th Avenue. Ian says, how is Mayor Bagley's mouth sitting, mouth sitting going? We need someone with some common sense running our community, not an idiot who is willing to sacrifice members of our community for his own business interest. The government should be helping small businesses keep their employees on the payroll. We should also be ensuring that these businesses are still around when COVID has settled down. How many billions has the state made from selling cannabis? And why is there no money for the local businesses that we all love and support when an emergency comes and affects our community? And then the last one, is from Stanley Toll, 2137 Dexter Drive, Apartment D. Stanley says, even in this time of pandemic when having housing is a life or death issue, housing discrimination is live and well against the most foldable in our community, in our community, those that have housing subsidies. This discrimination appears to be organized and pervasive. People who qualify for these subsidies often lose these subsidies because they cannot find suitable housing within the allotted time. With the present health emergency, these people face increased danger to their lives because of inadequate, inadequate housing. I would urge the city council to take emergency action to ensure that these people are protected against the present discriminatory practices that Longmont landlords are currently engaging in. Mayor, that is all the public comment for tonight. All right, great. Let's move on to the consent agenda and introduction and reading by title of first reading of ordinances, please. Thank you. 
I had to catch my breath. <laughs> So ordinance 2020-19 is a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel SH6T to Western Airport Development LLC. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 28, 2020. Ordinance 2020-20, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the sugar mill annexation, generally located south of Great Western Drive, north of St. Brain Creek and west of County Line Road, and zoning the property NAG Agriculture. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 28, 2020. Ordinance 2020-21, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 6.70 of the Longmont Municipal Code on marijuana stores. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 28, 2020. Resolution 2020-34, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the second amendment to the intergovernmental agreement for the funding and coordination of a joint compensation study between the City of Longmont, the Town of Estes Park, the City of Fort Collins, the City of Loveland, and Platte River Power Authority. Resolution 2020-33, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Longmont and the Collar Department of Human Services Office of Behavioral Health for contract amendment number 01, for original contract number 18 IHJA 107342 for Longmont Public Safety Lead Program. Resolution 2020-32, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the town of Lyons, the town of Mead, the town of Firestone, the county of Boulder, with the county of Weld and the state of Colorado Department of Transportation for an access control plan for Highway 66. Resolution 2020-35 is a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city, the city of Boulder and Boulder County for the COVID-19 recovery center for the homeless. And item H is authorized children, youth, and families to submit a grant application to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention to support Rewind, Rebuilding Expectations and Walking into New Direction. Councilmember Martin. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'd like to pull items 8B and 8D. All right, do we have a motion? I'll move the consent agenda. Uh, men, uh, men also started. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll move the consent agenda. Less B and D. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Aye. All opposed, say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. Let's move on to ordinances on second reading and public hearing on any matter. First is nine A ordinance twenty twenty dash oh nine, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter fourteen point three two of the Longmont Municipal Code on rates and regulations governing electric service. Um, are there any questions from council? All right. Are there any residents that that have called in for the public hearing on item nine A? Don. May, Mayor, we've received no public comment on this item. All right, great. And then, so we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, ask. I'm going to go ahead and ask for a motion. All right. I'll so move, you know, I'll I'll move uh, ordinance twenty twenty oh nine. Second. Right, second. It's been second. It's been moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by uh, Councilmember Martin. So, seeing no further discussion, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. I'll post a nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. Nine B Ordinance twenty twenty seventeen, a bill for an ordinance approving a farmland lease agreement between the City of Longmont and Sipe Farms LLC on the Double Six Ranch open space. Um, is there anything from Council? I believe no. Right. All right, seeing none, are there any questions from council? All right, also seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Don, do we have anybody? Mayor, we received no comment on this item either. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Can I have a motion, please? All right, I'll go ahead and move ordinance 2020-17. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Aye. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Let's go ahead and go to 9C, Ordinance 2020-18, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport, hangar parcel H71, H72, and H73 to Best Steel LLC. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, any questions from council? Any staff presentation from staff? Didn't think so. Let's go ahead and open up the public hearing. Don, is there anyone? Mayor, again, no comment on this one received either. All right, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Can I have a motion, please? Move 2020-18. Second. Seconded. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Council Member Martin. 
Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed aye. say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Let's go ahead, uh, Councilmember Martin, you pulled uh, item B. Can you yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. This shouldn't take too long, but I had a couple of questions uh, from constituents and they were both the same pretty much question. Um, uh, there was concern about creating a detention pond close to the St. Rain Creek because there's a, a known locus of pollution at the actual sugar mill itself. Now this looked pretty far apart um, to me, but uh, I wanted to ask the question and verify that there was not any any um, you know any danger of of leakage or pollution uh, in that detention pond in St. Rain Creek. Hi, uh, good evening, Council Member Martin, Eva Pehajewski, Planning and Development Services. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, just want to make sure you can hear me. Uh, yeah, our staff have reviewed that application and um, there are no known environmental impacts from the detention pond. The detention pond uh, on your concept plan there is up on the northwest corner of the property. Uh, the creek, mm -hmm. as you know, is, is all the way the south end. Um, so mm -hmm. there were no environmental impacts that were identified in either the applicants' environmental reports or from our public works staff. Okay, and do you know approximately uh, how far that detention pond is from the actual site of the sugar mill, which does have environmental concerns? The actual, like, physical distance from the sugar mill, well, that's north of Highway 119. Yes. Uh, I'd say that's several hundred feet away, guesstimating. I don't know okay. the specific distance. All right. So you're not worried about the environmental impact from that? Uh, again, that yeah, we, don't, we didn't have any identified through the environmental review uh, with our staff. Okay. And, and Ava, our staff that looks at that is actually our natural resources staff? Correct. Okay. In that case, um, I move passage of item O, 2020. Second. I'll second it. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Councilmember Dago Faring. Um, Councilmember Christensen, do you have a question or comment? <laughs> uh, yes. I would like us to put a condition on this. And the condition is because what we keep doing is we annex something that's a county agricultural land and then a year later or six months later it becomes something that gets built on. The people at Mill Village were promised that it would be a village and that there would be lots and lots of little shops around there. They didn't get that. What they got is a lot of um, um, apartments surrounding them and then they got some more apartments and housing on the uh, west side which was their view to the mountains and now we're proposing uh, this uh, part on the south side which they've been promised would be green space or open space sort of so i i would like to put a condition on this that this actually does stay agricultural land and that it cannot turn into um, built land, residential land. Is that an amendment to the motion? Uh, yes, I would like to make that. Well, I would like to make that a condition of this. I think we can approve things uh, with a condition attached. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Harold, do you want to answer that? I guess the real question is, are we not just conditionally approving the sugar mill annexation to just move forward to ask? It's not the first step. Uh, no, this is a different question. Um, Joni, if you can jump in. I think this one is also, um, hold on. Yeah. The concept plan is, um, 
is referenced in the annexation plan and it would have to come back to the council if somebody if they wanted to change it so it's it's coming in as an ag use now correct ava that's that's correct can you hear me yes yeah so it's coming in as ag use now and if somebody wanted to change that that would have to come back via an ordinance again to the city council to actually change it correct the prob problem is that these always do come back and we always do change them planning and zoning always approves them and council always approves changing them I would like just to put a condition on it right now so that they can't do that, so that it is what they say it is. Hey, Eugene, uh, you may have to jump in on this one, but I think if you put a condition, it would still follow the same process. You come back to council. Uh, it would depend what that condition is. Uh, you know, currently the ordinance is conditional on submittal requirements within a year. Uh, so it is possible to add additional conditions into that. All right, Councilmember Pick. Okay, well. Did you call on me? I did. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I would agree with that condition uh, because if it can come back within a year asking for um, a different zoning, then I think would not this condition disallow that? This is a question for uh, Eugene, I think. Eugene, you want to respond? Sure, Mayor and Council. I'm unclear what the condition is being proposed, that is being proposed. That they cannot come back for rezoning as mixed use development or residential development, that it must stay uh, agriculture. So my question is, if we put that conditional use on it now, uh, you stated that they could come back within a year. Would this uh, condition that we put on it now keep them from requesting a different zoning? later uh so clarification the ordinance as it's set up is a conditional approval and within a year they need to come back and satisfy submittal requirements for title 15. that, that i was just sort of explaining how the current ordinance is set up the proposal is to uh, put a condition that this remained agricultural in perpetuity is is that what I'm understanding? I think so, Eugene. Yes. You know, I haven't seen a condition like that uh, before. I think I would need to do legal research on our authority to impose a condition like that. All right, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'd just like to say that we are at such an uncertain time that whether it's allowable or not, it seems like this is the wrong time to put any perpetual conditions on anything. We may need to adapt. All right, so let's go ahead and vote on the amendment first. And then we will vote on the original motion. So, um, all in favor of Councilmember Christensen's amendment? And actually, Councilmember Christensen, can you actually restate your amendment? Okay. This is a condition. And it was seconded by Councilmember Peck, correct? Okay. Did it get a second? But the condition is that this remain agricultural land, that it is not eligible for being, for the zoning to be changed. Um, okay, D uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, I'm sympathetic to the to the point that Councilmember Christensen is making, uh, both in the interest of Mill Village and in um, 
uh, clarifying what the intent is to preserve this as open space. My, my, my only concern about the motion is what we just heard from Eugene and whether or not what we're doing is it passed the, a legal test. Uh, is, it, is it possible to bifurcate this to, to approve the, the annexation request and have this come back with an answer to the question if, if, we, if we approve the motion or the, approve the, the uh, condition that's, that's asserted in the motion that we're doing something that's going to hold up, not get us in legal trouble or be viewed as a taking or whatever the issues might be? Is that possible? Mayor and Council, I would uh, recommend uh, continuing this item to allow for City Attorney's Office to do the legal research. If you were to approve the ordinance, uh, I guess you could bring it back for a motion to reconsider, but you know, approval of an ordinance on second reading is sort of the end of the road. Um, So I think those are the options, either continue or approve now and, and potentially uh, bring it back on a motion to reconsider. I could certainly have the re legal research done by next regular session. This is first reading. Oh, this is first reading. Your, okay. Your point still holds true, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, my, get, my mistake, I thought we were on second reading. Um, you could approve it, and I could get you that information confidentially uh, between now and, and second reading. So, so we would still have an opportunity at second reading to to uh, to approve that condition if if we don't have any legal issues attached to that that action. Is that clear? Is that correct? Correct, Councilmember Waters. All right. So I, I just would say I. I'm sympathetic, but I'd, I'd personally, I'd rather wait. If we're going to vote on it tonight, I'll probably vote against it, the motion only because I don't know where we stand legally. I'd rather personally continue it and take that action when it comes back for second reading, knowing that we're not going to create some problem for the city. Is that a motion, Dr. Waters, to table the motion? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll move to table the motion. Right, I'll second it. Um, any debate on the issue of tabling this issue till next council meeting? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. The motion to table item 8B is postponed until the next meeting. Go nuts. Eugene, thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to Fair item. Down. Yep. Go ahead, Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Uh, just for clarification, um, are we... I understood uh, the city attorney to say that we, he would give us that information confidentially, and then we could um, put a condition on it at second reading. Did I understand him right? Rather than come back with it at next meeting. Can you clarify that? Eugene, is that accurate? Mayor and Council, Eugene May. Yeah, that was, that was one option, would be to approve tonight on first reading. I could get you additional information uh, shortly, and then council could make a decision on the condition on second reading. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, get us the information, Eugene. Thank you. All right, um, item 9D, Councilman Martin. You don't, we, don't we need to approve the ordinance on first reading? Uh, that, that's true, if there's a motion. Is there a motion? I'll move approval of uh, eight, be, I have to go scroll back up to the ordinance on first reading. I'll second that. Any further discussion or debate? Is Polly still around? Can somebody call Polly and get her back on? Mayor, she's on. I'm here. Uh, we, we lost her, your video. Okay. Really? Oh, All right. I'm here. Okay, here. well, let's go, let's go ahead and vote. There's a motion to pass uh, 8B on first reading. All in favor, um, say aye. Mayor, I, uh, don't we have two motions to pass uh, uh, on the one, table now? We, because I moved it first. I guess the like, two and motions. And we moved it again. It's, yeah. uh, it, it's been moved, <laughs> but the uh, eight, nine B will or eight B will be voted on. All in, all in favor, okay. say hi. Aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Now let's move on to eight D. 
a resolution of Longmont City Council approving the Second Amendment to the Intergovernmental Agreement for the Funding and Coordination of a Joint Compensation Study between the City of Longmont, the Town of Estes Park, the City of Fort Collins, the City of Loveland, and the Platte River Power Authority. Councilmember Martin? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I have a, a couple of questions about this. Um, uh, and uh, part of them part of them were uh, answered by the staff this afternoon, but I still want to ask them. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, this the scope of this study, um, is it just going to be a, a wage and salary study in terms of uh, what competitive wages are for a, a class of workers? Uh, among uh, different parts of the country uh, that that the municipal distribution utilities might hire? Or is it going to consider other options for filling the positions, such as the city and enga cities engaging in workforce development, um, you know, education support, uh, you know, other methods other than hiring on the competitive market. Uh, Council Member Martin, Mayor Bagley, members of City Council David Hornbacher here. Uh, good question, Council Member Martin. The scope of the study is to gather um, data specific to compensation for uh, different classes of electric utility positions as identified. And that just provides us with information. We also, when we look at overall compensation within the city of Longmont, this is a, a set of data points that we'd use, but we also look at what we also provide for competition as well as workforce development, uh, training, um, development plans and so forth, because we do feel it's very important to uh, nurture and grow our employees and that is also a uh, let's call it an attractive benefit that the city offers Thank i you. think uh, and to answer part of your question you know we have had some conversations um with representatives from the school district regarding the innovation center and in, in their p-tech program to say how can we uh, potentially look to the future in terms of attracting folks who who may want to have a career in terms of being a lines person um and we've dabbled in some of that with them i know sandy's worked with them on the technology side i think that's another piece of the conversation that we have to look as a broader talent pool for the organization and we need to do that more holistically in terms of how do we encourage people to go into the programs where we know and we see a, a lag in potential applicants in the future and i think that's a different conversation that we also want to continue okay uh thank you harold um uh that's fine i pretty much just wanted to get um that option and that course of strategy especially if we're going to be in money saving mode uh on the table and uh express my supports for it so with that i move passage of resolution 2020-34 i'll second all right, 8D has been moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by uh, Councilmember Rialto Faring. There's no other debate or discussion. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. All right. Um, let's move on to the tail end of our WebEx meeting. Um, let's go ahead and move to 11. Are we doing okay, by the way? Is it okay to power through the end here? Yeah, but did you vote nay on this last resolution, Mayor Bagley? No, I did not. Passed unanimously. Okay. Sorry. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm going to have to step away for two minutes. Do you want us to stop, Harold, or do you want us to go ahead and request for the City okay. Council to refer the Westview Acres annexation and the annexation review process? Do you want us to wait for you? It would be great if you could wait for me for two let's, minutes. Let's go ahead and wait for two minutes. Let's, let's all take a break for five. All right? Thanks.
move on to general business. 11A, request for city council to refer the Westview Acres annexation into the annexation review process. And uh, earlier when I was re referring to the to, uh, first step, this is it. Correct, Harold? All right, so all we're doing is uh, approving uh, the idea that city staff Correct. can go ahead and entertain the idea of the the Westview Acres annexation. We're not approving it. Do we have right. a Councilmember Peck? Um, thank you, Mayor Backley. I will approve the uh, annexation process, but I do want to make a statement that I personally do not um, want to annex any more lands for development that are in the airport uh, influence zone until we get some of those lawsuits, especially the Part 16 uh, lawsuit, because we just keep getting more and more people who are complaining about that. And I would like to have some kind of resolution on where we're going, what is that all about? And um, if we keep growing the city out that way, we're just gonna continue with the complaints without any way or any answer to what we're doing at the airport. So um, I'll agree to put it in the process, but I just wanted to make that statement. Councilmember Peck, I'm sorry, Councilmember Christensen. Okay. Um, is there any affordable housing in this or is there any payment in lieu? Or did this, yes, I'd like to know that. Eva. Yes, uh, council members, uh, at this point uh, in the referral process, uh, the applicant has not stated whether they're going to provide 12% of the units on site or whether they're going to pay the cash in lieu because we're very preliminary at this process. Um, I think as we go through annexation proceedings, if it were approved tonight, uh, and I do have a small presentation if you'd like to see it, um, but that hasn't been fleshed out at this point. I think the answer, well, the answer to the the specific answer is they will have to provide 12% or 12% cash in lieu. We just don't know which at this point. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to point out once again, we're taking agricultural land and turning it into luxury housing. Okay. Councilman Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, while I don't necessarily disapprove of taking agricultural land and turning it into something else, because we've got a lot of open space, uh, I don't think that the land use in the rough concept plan that we have at this point is consistent with our vision for the city. Um, now, uh, the Best All Collaboratives has some other projects in the city. I mean, my suspicion would be that they intend to uh, uh, satisfy uh, the uh, affordable housing ordinance with, with uh, credits from other projects in the city. But um, do we really want to, to squander one of the last developments available to Longmont on large lot? Um, you know, cul-de-sac, winding road kind of developments. Um, I'm not, I'm not real excited about that concept plan. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, you know, I, I, I'm one of uh, probably several council members who's met with the developer and, and seen other things that, that this developer wants to do. And, uh, and I've been impressed with both the person and, and other projects. So this is not about, you know, this is not about the developer and this how stand up they are and anything like that. But for me, just fundamentally, the idea of it continuing to annex at the edge of Longmont, uh, in this case, kind of the most extreme south uh, west edge of, of town for this kind of a project for 22 lots that are not the housing stock that we've we've all agreed that we need. And at the end of the day, if I understand on the upside uh, where um, uh, 
if this were to go through the annexation application process and be annexed and developed, you know, there's some upside in terms of use tax or whatever in terms of building uh, on that property, assuming people are buying their, their building materials from, from something inside our city limits. But over the long run, somebody's going to have to persuade me even to refer this to the, to the review process that the revenues per acre generated on this project are going to be sustainable over the next 25 or 40 years. Because this is a classic example of a project that, that is going to cost the city way more than, than, than it's going to generate in property tax and other forms of revenues. Other parts of Longmont, I believe, over the long run, will have to subsidize the city's cost to maintain infrastructure for something that's for, for this particular project that's developed on that site with this level of density. And if I don't get the economics of it, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be all players, I'd like to learn. But based on you know what I think I've learned, uh, this just doesn't, this doesn't play as, as a benefit to the city. I understand why it's a benefit to the developer. I understand why it's a benefit to the investors. Somebody tell me how it's in a benefit to the city for me to vote yes, even to refer it for review. Because right now, I don't see it, and I'm going to vote no unless somebody can persuade me otherwise. All right, seeing no one else, do we have a motion for 11A? All right, there's no motion for 11A at this point. So, all right, let's move on to 11B, 2020 legislative bills recommended for city council position. Sandy Cedar, are you hiding and lurking somewhere on this WebEx broad, uh, podcast? Mayor, she is not logged in. It was she expected. Oh, no, I just was wondering if uh, she had any 2020 legislative bills. I don't think she has any. All right, cool. I, I was going to say, Mayor, I think they're, they're still uh, not meeting the legislature, so there are no items. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to final call, public invite to be heard. I'm assuming there's none, correct? Just us, we are all, all here. Right. <laughs> let's move on to mayor and council comments. All right, seeing none. And, and I guess I guess the only thing I wanna say is uh, as an elected mayor. servant. Yeah, go ahead, council member. Yeah, sorry, sorry, council member uh, Christensen. I just want to remind people once again to fill out their census form. You have time on your hands, fill out your census form, please. We've had it since 1779, just do it. It's how we get federal money. Um, and also everybody, we've been doing a really terrific job and a lot of people have really joined for us and that's the kind of town long money. Is. So keep on, keep on it, keep the faith, We'll do better. Uh, it'll take a while. It's going to be rough, but we're doing okay. Thank you. All right, great. Council Mayor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanted to say that not this past Sunday, which was Easter, but the Sunday before there was a, a great turnout for the honk uh, appreciation at the Longmont United Hospital. Policemen showed up, fire station, fire trucks showed up. And everybody honked uh, for um, the caregivers there in appreciation for the caregivers. And if we could do that again, I think it would be great. It, it really was a super, super turnout. So thank everybody who did that. Council member Idago Faring. So um, yeah, today we had our um, WebEx meeting with the youth council. And they're working on um, a project to put out online, actually celebrating our seniors, our high school seniors. So they're going to, um, I think every week, they're going to turn something out to post on their Facebook and get out on social media. Um, because our, our poor high schoolers, you know, they're, they're having to make a lot of adjustments. And um, I feel really, you know, it was, it was bringing me to tears listening to some of the seniors there talk about you know just really missing out on that experience and what what they had had planned for their senior year and and it's it's lost so you know my heart goes out to them and i wanted to let you know most our long one seniors know I'm, I'm thinking about you and um yeah and, and keep keep an eye out on social media to um 
to look for that celebration of seniors. All right, great. Anybody else? I guess the only thing I want to say is, uh, you know, going back to my, uh, when, the, when this first started, as we all know, I said some comments that were pretty emotional. And uh, essentially what I was only asking is I was asking for data, right? And so uh, I'm not calling for anything at this moment, but I just want to point out that uh, every single email and call that I've received, every single one criticizing my comments calls me an idiot, stupid, swears, um, and it just gets old. And so, uh, uh, and I have yet to, to have my questions answered, um, which are, uh, you know, what, what are the consequences? Meaning I'm not calling that we end this. I just want to, just, I just want the data. Um, uh, unemployment's at 13%. That doesn't mean that I love money. What, it's mean, what it means is it's estimated that as much as 40,000 people will kill themselves for every 1% increase in unemployment. Um, 50% of, uh, of people with heart failure. I mean, you're at a higher, you're at a 50% higher risk of heart failure if you're suffering from a heart attack, um, if, you're, if you're dealing with unemployment. Um, and so I'm not calling for a change. I'm just pointing out that I would really appreciate it if politics would take a back seat as we're dealing with all this, because I think we're all stressed. Um, and, uh, I just really don't appreciate, I'll listen to public, I'll, I'll listen to public invited to be heard, but, uh, it really grates on me when, uh, when people swear. And so I would appreciate if people in the future would enter the public discourse with data questions and some maturity. So anyway, anybody else? All right, Harold, anybody, you? No comments, mayor council. All right, Eugene. No comments, Mayor. All right, great. There's nothing else. We are adjourned. Another Tuesday down. All right, thank you. All right.